Good evening. Tonight is uh, Plato's Symposium. We're on a cycle of myths. And this is the myth of poverty, plenty, and love, and Aphrodite in Plato's Symposium. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot in that. And The biggest problem in studying mythology is that we've created the problem. You have to see how a myth is used by an author because different authors use mythology in different ways. Mythology, therefore, is a challenge. It offers a wide range of uses. Therefore, if you want to study <clears throat> myth, the best thing to do is to go to the most profound set of thinkers to see how they use mythology. Because then from that, you can see from the ideal those that are less than that ideal. And it's easier to see the differences. Other part of the problem. Our way of approaching mythology is that people read a work and they identify something in a work that has gods and goddesses mythology, they cut it out of the particular section and then they separate it and they put it in a book like a cookbook with many other myths and they call that collecting the mythology together and then they get a way of uh, bringing it about in terms of family origins and generations of the gods and they put it together in a complete package and that's called the study of mythology. Okay, that's stripping it from its context. That's independent of the author who's using it, and therefore you will never discover the purpose to which it's being used. Because the purpose is in the context. Therefore, we want to just take a look at a few things before we go into Plato's Symposium. All right? Okay, first of all, every myth there must be at least one divine figure. That means either a god or goddess, or a son of a god or a son of a goddess. And Achilles, of course, was the son of a goddess, Thetis. So therefore, in a myth, you have at least one figure of divine descent, either divine or divine de descent. There must be a drama about the figure, a storyline, a drama. And the divine figure must be the personification of a set of qualities brought together into a unity. It serves a purpose, must have a purpose. The purpose can be found in the context in which the myth is embedded. Now, get to the purpose. I think it's obvious to everyone that love is a problem. Fair enough? Love is a problem. Love is a problem. We do not agree. We can see the power of love in all of nature, all conceptual birthing. Well, look here. I want to ask about that for a moment. Please come up for a few moments now with your own explanation for the origin of love in the universe, please. not for any particular species or purpose, but throughout all nature. And if there are other planets, the whole universe. All right, okay, come up with a couple now, all right. Got a couple of them? I'm gonna call upon you for a few minutes, in a few minutes. I want to hear an account, your account, of how did love ever get into the universe? It's totally unnecessary. 
in a mechanical universe. In a mechanical universe, there's no need for two things. Love, and worse than that, more complex than that, there's no need for the second most wondrous thing. Beauty, no need for it. Everything in nature that's engaged in this tremendous effort of procreation might do it by all kinds of mechanical ways and appearances of colors and scents and sizes and shapes and everything else. There's no need for this at all. It's totally unnecessary. So we have two mysteries. Love and beauty. Can't leave one without the other. So now look here. How can you take something in the natural world and use it to understand something metaphysical? But actually, our practice, since you know about our other myths, we're going to do exactly the opposite. <laughs> we're not going to go for that theory. It's a waste of time. We're going to go to the metaphysical and then use that to understand the everyday. You can't go up, you gotta go down. You can't go up, you can't go from the everyday and discover the metaphysical. You have to grasp the metaphysical and use it to understand the everyday. Now, the context. The context of this myth are these four ideas. Now, the whole and simple way of understanding Plato is that you never use your own definitions for these ideas, but only the authors. Never deviate, no interpretation, because he's using these words in a totally different way. Let me give you an example. Ignorance is not ignorance in the everyday sense. It's, uh-oh, ran out of gas. Here you can see a beautiful picture here. And this person happens to have, as you can see in this beautiful diagram, a thing called a belief. Well, three out of four. All right. Here you can see in this beautiful diagram person with a belief. Now, they have a very interesting and a special belief, which makes them ignorant. It is absolutely impossible for this person with this belief ever, ever, to use it to hit the truth. They'll never get the bullseye. That's ignorance. What's ignorance? Is when you have a belief, and that belief is, a, is of such a kind that that belief will block you and make it impossible for you to hit the mark. That is to say, the mark is truth. You can't possibly hit it with the belief you have. That's ignorance. Now, opinion in this case is going to be when you are told, when you are told, not when you discover, when you are told the right way to go somewhere. And so therefore, you reach some junction and you're puzzled and in some way usually by another person or a work, you're told which way to go. That's an opinion. Therefore, you have an opinion about how to reach the truth. Now, it's a very interesting kind of opinion. <laughs> it's a right opinion or a true opinion.
but the person who has it doesn't know it's true. They believe it's true. Now, in the process of proceeding now, if that person ever discovers the reasons why, the reasons why it's a true opinion, why it's true, if they discover the reasons, why it's true, they have understanding. Understanding means nothing other than that. Now, just because you understand why that opinion happens to be right or true doesn't mean you have knowledge. Just as if someone came up to you and said, could you please tell me how to get to San Francisco because they didn't know how to get there, and you say, well, I'll tell you what, I happen to know the way to get there. You take this road here, follow it, don't get off that road, and sure enough, in the end, you'll get there. Well, they hope they're giving you the true opinion. They don't know it's true, but they do have an opinion. When they get there, much to their surprise, they will have discovered something. Why haven't they reached it? That is to say, they confirmed the truth of the true opinion in their own experience. Now they got something. They confirm the truth of a true opinion in their own experience. Now they could go back and meet you again and they could say, thank you very much. But suppose you hadn't go ever gone to San Francisco either. You just happened to know the right road to go there. Then they could tell you why that opinion that you gave them is true because they could show you a map and point out if you're not familiar with a map, introduce you to a map and they could show you therefore that following these kinds of signs and this kind of information, that their information was true. They wouldn't know. They haven't confirmed it. Haven't confirmed it. So therefore, let's go back, right? So if you have a belief, some beliefs may block you from ever reaching the truth. If you have a belief there's no such thing as San Francisco, with that belief you're not going to take a trip there. You're not even going to be interested in gaining any opinions about the nature of San Francisco. If you do, however, get suspend that belief, and now you have an interest in this curious place, then you'll be gathering opinions about it. If, for one reason or the other, you suddenly have a true opinion about it, and act upon it, then that means you're going to try to confirm what it is that you've received as the true opinion. And then, if you know the reasons why it's true, you have understanding. Confirm it, knowledge. These two are going to be together, knowledge and wisdom, but we want to wait for a minute. Now, before you can talk about this curious myth, we have to know something about this. Now, the only thing we need to know is that, which everybody would agree, that is, that there is a vast and wondrous power to love. Right. It's a vast and wondrous power to love. Now, the reason why we have to go to the metaphysical level is because we have to open up the higher dimension of the nature of love in order to talk about it philosophically. So therefore, by talking about the power of it, talking about the power of it, that will allow us to see the range, its range or scope, and then we can use more precision in dealing with the way in which that power functions. So therefore, in Socrates' great speech, 
which is from his teacher. His teacher was a woman, reported to be a woman, by the name of Diatima. All right, there she is. Looked very much like this on the old wine bottles. And Diatima, Socrates' teacher then, unfolds to him a whole teaching about the subject, about the nature of love, of which he is said to be the wisest, wisest teacher. And in doing it, she then relates this very interesting model of the power of love. Now, in that model of love, we will see the upper reaches of it. And in that upper reaches of it, that becomes the metaphysical realm. Once we have the, the model of the power of love and can see the higher dimensions of it, what's involved in it, we can go back to the four categories we had a moment ago and we can see what must come in order for the whole thing to make a, uh, a splendid unity. So therefore, we need the model. Therefore, luckily enough, I happen to have brought the text. And I can use either one, out of the lobe as well as the uh, Rouse edition. So just quickly, it's a very interesting, very short paragraph. And therefore, at uh, page 98 in the Rouse, which is uh, approximately 202D, after Socrates is introduced to these four ideas, what are they? Ignorance, right opinion, understanding, and knowledge. Teotima introduces, therefore, something quite remarkable. She says um, that the God um, How could a god be a god who has no share in beautiful and good things? That's the question, right? How could a god be a god who has no share in beautiful and good things? Or we can say beauty and goodness. Therefore, we can look at it and we can say, from this rhetorical question, which is, uh, becomes rhetorical, if, if there is such a thing as a God, that God must share in beauty and goodness. That is the theory of what is sometimes called Plato's theory of participation. And that is therefore stating that if a God is a God, they will share in, participate in, beauty. And that beauty must be linked to goodness. So these two words are going to be joined. Beauty and goodness. Now, see, we're already on the theological level. We're already sneaked into the theological level. And now we want to play with it at a physical theological level. So therefore, Socrates asks, given this, he says, then what could love be? A mortal? Not at all, she said. What then? What could love be? Love, therefore, is between two extremes. Love is between two extremes. In nearly all metaphysics, a mean analogy is the controlling element. It is the controlling element because any two things, whatever they may be, if there is any way in which they can be linked together, if there is any point about which they can be linked together, that linkage is a mean analogy. A is to C, two extremes, A and C. That common area which they share we'll call B. Therefore, we can say A is to B as B is, oh, excuse me, as B is to C. Right? 
So any two things in the universe that must be brought together in any way in which they can be said to be related, in any way they can be said to be combined, in any way they can be said to join into a synthesis presupposes a mean analogy. So quickly, let me sketch the structure of the model. And matter of fact, I can do it if I can get you to read. Thank you. Would you be so kind as to read? Thank Just you. as before then, between, look here, see, mortal <coughs> and the immortal. Now, when you do Plato, you create. You create and you fill in. You add to whatever it is you develop. We're creating a map, an intellectual map. That's what we're doing right now. And it must keep on going for the entire dialogue. So, yes, I'll keep going. What is it then, Diotima? A great spirit, Socrates. For all the spiritual is between divine and mortal. That's the main term. The spiritual is the main term. Go ahead. What power has it, said I? See, we're getting the power of love in this model. All right, what is the power of love? Mm -hmm. To interpret and to ferry across to the gods things given by men. Two things go this way, all right, from men to the gods, so then we can put up here gods, men, mankind, all right? And to men, things from the gods. Cool. From men, Petitions and sacrifices. Right. Man always sends up petitions and sacrifices to the gods as equally the gods are sent to send back. Go ahead. And from the gods, commands and requitals in return. Right. Which is letting you off a command or letting you off uh, the petitions. Right. To requit. Right. Commands, I tell you to do this and I'll now release you from that command as a requital. Right? I command you to do A, B, and C. Okay, that's enough. Requite it. Okay, go ahead. And being in the middle, it completes them. Okay. It completes them. And binds all together into a whole. See, okay. that's what the main analogy does. That's what it does. It binds it together into a whole. Through this intermediary moves all the art of divination and the art of priests and all concerned with sacrifice and mysteries and incantations, and all better translated sorcery and witchcraft. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. All right, a little bit more. For God mingles not with man, but through this comes all the communion and conversation of gods with men and men with gods. Therefore, Both gods the are involved in a dialogue with mankind, through the activities of these arts that pass through this great thing called love. That's the intermediary. Go ahead. Both awake and asleep. Right. And he who is expert in this is a spiritual man. Okay. What's the list? The art of divination, the art of priests and priestesses. Right. And uh, it's actually uh, not sorcery and witchcraft, but... Yeah, that's true, that's true, all right, that's true. And all concerned with sacrifices, initiations, all right, to have that? Sacrifice, Some. mysteries, incantations, all sorcery and witchcraft. Right. Look, the person who is the master of that, that's truly a spiritual person, and therefore they are standing, as it were, as the mean. They are then functioning as love is. Ah, now look here. That means, does it not, that if his teacher, Diotima, shows that she has been effective in divination, sacrifices, incantations, initiations, all of these things, then she is then, watch the term, she then can be said to be the personification, pulls all of those qualities within herself, 
Therefore, she can represent in herself the mastery of all of those arts. And that, if that's the case then, Socrates' teacher was the personification of all of those things brought together into a unity. Therefore, she functions as the mean between these two extremes. Ah, good, good. All right, keep going. He who is expert in this is a spiritual man, but the expert in something other than this, such as common arts or crafts, is a vulgar man. So we'll put a little halo <laughs> right on her to indicate These spirits spiritual. are many and of all sorts and kinds, and one of them is love. Therefore, spirit, this, this entire region between man and the, the immortals or gods is a spiritual realm. And the person who can function that way through all of these arts, very high arts, that's called truly a spiritual person. They're functioning, therefore, in this way and completing it. When they complete it, therefore, the gods are able to have a dialogue with man through this kind of a figure. And the correct translation, I think, is shaman more? Shaman, shaman? yes, so than rather than, than that's than true. Than yes, mm -hmm. that's good, thank you. Yeah. All right. Now, excuse me, does her name uh, mean anything? Well, uh, Tema is to uh, trust. And Dia sometimes is uh, one of the ways of translating the idea of God. So a, a trust in God, Dia Tima. Dios, right? Dia, Dio. No, not Dia, Dio Tima. All right, good. Now, all we need, all we need is uh, a risk, okay? Someone risk. What, 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 you, look here, you now have to come up with a theory. You now have to try to give an explanation of why there is love in the universe. Right? You have to try. It doesn't make any difference. What you have to try? Now, we're going to put this back into this, you see. Now, whatever belief you have, it should be the kind of belief which should help us gain wisdom. So if you have a belief about the nature of love in the universe, but that kind of idea that you have is not the kind of belief that can allow you to reach that goal, then you are ignorant. So. And that means, therefore, if you recognize it, you may want to get over it, and therefore you can then open yourself up to possibly new opinions. You will not know whether they are true, but you'll be invited to participate in a series of them, and then you must then consider, gee, if all of these things can be said together in such a way, perhaps there is some reason why they're called true understanding. Then if you can confirm all of that in your own experience, knowledge or wisdom. So, this, well, why is there love? Why? Yeah, why, why, what's the reason? What's the origin of it? Yeah, what, just, I can't hear you. To join the mortal and, and the immortal. To be able to communicate yeah, but what's, yeah, okay. What's the reason for that? Yeah, you're, you're, I'm not rejecting your answer. What's the reason for yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, why, you know, what do you need why it for? Is there for? a need for that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Because the mortal doesn't, can't, doesn't have that ability without some aid. Yeah. Without some help. Yes. Power. Yeah. One of the most difficult questions in this game is to know when you have an answer to and whether or not you've answered a question or not. That's one of the most important questions. How do you know when you have an answer that it really answers the question that's being posed? Yeah, want to try one? No, how do you know whether you have the right answer to a question? How? 
That's right, I asked that. Oh. Good heavens. <laughs> Did you see that? Here, my question, and you take it over as if it were your own. Ah, I'm shocked. See, well, there has to be love in order for there to be a unified theory or a unified metaphysics. Like there has to be some mean between the two extremes in order for there to be balance and harmony in the universe. Mm -hmm. But. Mm -hmm. Well, look here. I tell you, let's. The origin of love has to be something prior, to, prior to everything else in the universe. It has to be there first. It has to be. Well, okay. If love is hold that, see, consider that. Now you're making a statement, right? Love has to be there first. Okay, so you keep that in mind in the way in which you're visualizing it. Okay, good. Yes, please. So that I can have fun. I want to turn it upside down and start from here. Could be, could be. All right. So we'll shift the question now to what is the origin of love? What does that mean? How did love come into the universe? What kind of explanation be given for that? And that's why we need the next sentence. Now we're going to go into the myth. Who was his father? And who was his mother? When you personify, you see, personify love, make it into a person, then you can ask the question, if it's a person, who was its father and who was its mother? That's a rather long story. Right? See how you do it? You personify these great mysteries, and then now you can ask about them in respect to the nature of the story itself. The nature of the story itself is if that love can be said to be the personification of some, someone, right? There it is, love, personified as a person. Then you can ask what's the origin of the person. Now, whatever qualities, now look here, whatever things you say come together into a unity Whatever you say, that, that can be brought together into unity, that personifies the Father, then you're talking about the qualities that brought into existence love. And won't you also have another mean analogy between the Father and the Mother? Yes, 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 yes. That would be bringing them together. That's another mean analogy. Quite true, quite true. Okay, all right, now, let's play. Now, we have to then have a particular set of qualities for each of these people. We said before, therefore, did we not, that one of them has to be divine. So one or some of these must be divine. They must be able to personify. And therefore, by the way, when you have an ideal personification of something, you have a symbol. Symbol. That's the nature of moving from a personification. When a personification represents the qualities most ideally into a unity, that becomes a symbol. Good. Let's charge. Now we're going to get the drama. Go ahead. When Aphrodite was born, the gods held a feast. Among them, Plenty, the son of Never at a Loss. And that's a great name for a father, is it not? He was never at a loss. All right. Now we're going to get the qualities. Okay. When they had dined, poverty came in begging, as might be expected with all that good cheer, and hung about the doors. Mm -hmm. yeah. Plenty then got drunk on the nectar, for there was no wine yet, and went into Zeus's park, all heavy, and fell asleep. Passed out, see? 
So poverty, because of her penury, made a plan to have a child from plenty, and lay by his side, and conceived love. And in heaven this takes just a short while, yeah. and out comes... This is why love has become follower and servant to Aphrodite, having been begotten at her birthday party. And at the same time, he is by nature a lover busy with beauty because Aphrodite is beautiful. Then, since love is the son of plenty and poverty, he gets his fortunes from them. First, he is always poor, and far from being tender and Now, what we're going to get is a series of qualities for each of the figures in the myth. We're going to identify, you should then go back through the story and list every single one of the qualities assigned to each of these figures. And when they come together, you want to know then what are the set of qualities that love has. And you'll tell me later, perhaps, which ones are excluded, or are they all brought together? These kinds of questions we can ask now. Go ahead. He's always poor, far from being tender and beautiful as most people think. He is hard and rough and unshod and homeless, lying always on the ground without bedding, sleeping by the doors and in the streets in the open air, having his mother's nature always dwelling with want. See, always in want. Now, I'm not writing all the qualities down, as you can see. I just want to get a few of them. All right, go ahead. But from his father again, he has designs upon beautiful and good things. Being brave and go ahead and high strung, a mighty hunter, always weaving devices, and a successful coveter of wisdom, a philosopher all his days, a great wizard and sorcerer and sophist. Good, 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 good. He was born neither mortal nor immortal. Right, born neither mortal nor immortal. But on the Therefore, same she could not have been a god born neither mortal nor immortal. That's a mixture. There's a mix. We have a mix. Ah, he's a mix. All right, mortal. All right. Does that fit our myth, our model? Go ahead, good. He was born neither mortal nor immortal. But on the same day, sometimes he is blooming and alive. When he has plenty, sometimes he is dying. Then again, he gets new life through his father's nature. But what he procures in plenty always trickles away, so that love is not in want nor in wealth. And again, he is between wisdom and ignorance. Now that's contradictory, I just noticed. Love is not in one. So sometimes it's in one and sometimes it's not. Of course. The truth is this, no God seeks after wisdom or desires to become wise. See, so we right. added features to this model in that last description. You have to keep going back and build on this through the entire dialogue. He added here wisdom. Added here, ignorance. All right. So please back it up a sentence or two. So the love is not in want nor in wealth, and again, he is between wisdom and ignorance. The truth is this. No God seeks after wisdom or desires to become wise, for wise he is already. Nor does anyone else seek after wisdom if he is wise already. 
And again, the ignorant do not seek after wisdom nor desire to become wise. For this is the worst of ignorance, that one who is neither... Okay, notice now, he goes back to our former distinctions, and he's going to focus on two terms, ignorance and wisdom. He is not going into opinion or understanding. So this whole thing that we developed, you see, now he wants to focus only on these two terms. These two drop out. This, therefore, is a model that features the motion, the movement, between the two. And therefore, implicit in this must be right opinion and understanding. But he doesn't need it because he's talking about the extremes and the mean that runs through it. Ah, go ahead. This is the worst of ignorance that one who is neither beautiful and good nor intelligent should think himself good enough. So he does not desire it because he does not think he is lacking in what he does not think he needs. Now that last line is absolutely critical in order to understand the myth because that's the condition of man. That's the condition of man. Could you read just what it is to be ignorant? Right. It's very important. For this is the worst of ignorance. Ah, now I'm going to make someone ignorant. All right, here he is. All right. Ignorant. Let's make sure we see it. Go ahead. One who is neither beautiful and good. He's neither beautiful nor good. Nor intelligent. Nor intelligent. Should think himself good enough. But he thinks himself that he's good enough. Good enough. So he does not desire it. So he doesn't desire beauty, goodness, or intellect because he's satisfied with where he is. Because he does not think he is lacking. Because he doesn't think he lacks it. And what he does not think he needs. That's right. We don't use the word wisdom in our culture anymore. No one knows what they mean by wisdom. We don't think we lack it. We don't make any distinction between understanding and wisdom. The term is never used, except in ads. And it's never used. He is going to use it. He needs it. Now, back into it. Back into it. That's the end of the myth. That's the whole myth. Now, what can we do with this? Now, we were making some interesting statements, weren't we? We were saying you have to go first understand what's going on metaphysically and then apply it to the phenomenal world, right? So let's go back and take a look at this. In terms only of what we know about the myth, and we can get it to be read once again if we need to, what was the birth of love? How did it come into existence? See, now we can talk about the myth. Watch the way we do it, all right? Say, what was the origin of love in the myth? How did love come into existence? Loud, please, so I can. Um, at the birth of uh, Aphrodite. On the same day, right? Remember the language. On the same day. What were they doing in the heavens? They were holding a banquet. They were celebrating what? The birth of Aphrodite. Now, of course, you have to be a little Greek here at the moment. Everybody knows that Aphrodite is the goddess of beauty. So look here. What were the gods celebrating? The birth of what? Beauty. Divine beauty, right? So the origin of love in the universe occurred mythically then with the birth of Aphrodite. She personifies beauty, therefore we can say, what happened? Well, good heavens, beauty had to come in the universe. The gods were holding a feast for what? A great banquet for what? The birth of divine beauty. Oh, so this whole myth depends upon that. So therefore, they're starting with the fact that there must be something 
essential in the very nature of reality, and that is divine beauty, because the gods held a great feast in honor of it. That's the birth of Aphrodite. And on the same day that, notice we can substitute for Aphrodite, on the very same day that divine beauty came into existence, on that very same day, what comes into existence? Love. Love. Ah. So, metaphysically then, if you understand the nature of divine beauty, you know immediately that at the same time there must come into existence love. Same day, same time. Now why that is so we don't know yet, but we know that's what the myth is revealing. All right, well then. What was happening, therefore, now notice, the myth is not concerned with the birth of Aphrodite, what factors brought her into existence, because that would be then another kind of myth explaining how divine beauty came into existence. We're having a myth to account for the existence of love in the universe. So therefore, there are levels of mythology. Now, what was going on now, now we're going more into the myth, what was going on at the time? While well, they were holding a banquet, and now we have to assume a, an existence of poverty and plenty. All of those qualities must have existed and have a prior existence in the nature of reality. They must be there in place before love comes into existence. Would you agree with that? Must be. Therefore, you take all of those qualities together that are personified by plenty and poverty, and you must say then that these are the predisposing qualities that must already be in place in the universe before love can come into existence. They only come together, they only come together when Aphrodite is born. That's when they come together. So these two powers come together at the very moment divine beauty occurs into the universe. And that, therefore, becomes the need to bring them together, a synthesis, a mean analogy. And that mean analogy, as you correctly pointed out, is love. Now, let's see if we can get more into this. Let's take a look at the myth again. So it's only a few lines. So could you read it once more, and I'll tell you exactly where, so we can cut, cut it down a little bit and go, have a little fun by going into it. What I'm interested in, you see, in this great myth, right? When they had dined, right? It's a banquet, right? Therefore, the banquet is going on. Go ahead, please, just those next two sentences. When they had dined, poverty came in begging, as might be expected with all that good cheer. Hey, when the gods are celebrating the birth of divine beauty, who comes in? Poverty. Wait a minute. What are all the qualities of poverty? Remember them? Rough, hard, unshod, homeless, lying on the ground without bedding. That's, that's want, need, need, you skipped a major one, see? Why didn't you Right, could you do it? Uh, the qualities are rough, hard, unshod, homeless, lying on the ground. See, unshod is a bad, bad translation, right? Without shoes, shoes <laughs> poverty, right? And need, Sleeping all of those qualities suggest need, Does, right? Sleeping by the doors. See, no doors. house, right? Having his mother's Me. nature. Poverty. Always, See the name? Yeah. Always dwelling with want. Always dwelling with want. Right? Needs, wants. So a primordial, right, most most paramount basic need comes in, right, brings comes together with plenty, the other extreme. So we want some more qualities of poverty, right? We get them together. And now she's hanging where? In by the doors. By the doors. And she can't come in until he passes out. Mm. Now look here. Where is this taking place? Zeus's garden. 
in the Garden of Zeus. Now, Zeus and Plato and all of the uh, Neoplatonic thinkers and Platonic thinkers, the Garden of Zeus is the flowering of Zeus, and Zeus is the same as Nous, which is divine intellect. Therefore, this is a banquet held to celebrate the birth of divine beauty, and it's being held in the flowering, the garden, the flowering of the divine intellect. So we have the birth of a divine goddess, of divine beauty, and they're celebrating a great banquet, and then this unfoldment of the nature of love and how love comes into existence takes place in the flowering of the intellect, see, in the flowering of the garden of Zeus, the flowering, magnificent garden of the intellect. Okay, go ahead. Mm. Plenty then got drunk on the nectar. Right, nectar is the deathless drink. That's deathless what nectar drink, means, right? right? Ne no, deathless. That's the immortal part. Then. That's the immortal part. Deathless. Immortal. Right. Right. And what does he do? Passes out. Hey, becomes, right? Heavy and fell asleep. Well, we call it asleep. And when, when in mythology, when the gods go to sleep, right, that's some way of saying that they pass out to the everyday world. And that's often described in a variety of ways. The simplest one is bliss. Right, right. So they're, in, they're another world. They're in their own world. Right. That's the drink of immortality, nectar. And at that time, she then obviously has a great desire, need for plenty. At that moment, she then joins him and conceives. But she lays beside him and conceives love. Yeah, yes. Are you thinking about the laying beside when you're... Laying beside instead of joining. Well, you're, you're suggesting... Um, um, See, she makes a plan to have a child, lays yes. by side and conceives love. Yes, isn't that a good way to do it? Well, I don't see any active participation on this part. But That's very important. That's absolutely important. See, the myth cannot make any sense on the human level. A recent study by Alexander Finsky, right? A very great study showed uh, three, uh, three of his uh, great researchers went out and they found that very few men could conceive, could bring about conception when they were unconscious. This was a startling discovery. This was a very startling discovery. And the study was hidden because the um, implications are enormous. <laughs> yes, you see, it violates our sense of common sense, that's right. But not on a mythical level. If we're talking about, it's at this moment that something is, comes to birth. It's at this moment something comes to birth. It's conceived, see. And in this model, there's no space between conception and birth. So, please, watch now. Keep going. This is why love has become follower and servant of Aphrodite, having been begotten at her birthday party. See, because he was begotten at the Birth of banquet birth. where divine beauty was brought into existence. Now, what does he do? Now, watch the language. The same time he is by nature a lover busy with beauty. He's busy with beauty. That's Aphrodite, right? He's busy with beauty. That's his quest. An attendant and servant of beauty. Go ahead. Attends it. Because Aphrodite is beautiful. Then since love is the son of plenty and poverty, he gets his fortunes from them. Mm -hmm. Then we go back into the list. Now we go back into the myth. Right. Do you want yes, please. First, he is always poor, and far from being tender and beautiful as most people think, 
He is hard and rough and unshod and homeless, lying always on the ground without bedding, sleeping by the doors and in the streets in the open air, having his mother's nature, always dwelling with want. Okay. That's the drive in love to pursue Aphrodite. Right. Now, would you agree necessarily with these kinds of qualities then what must love be if it can satisfy all those things? Pardon me, what must Aphrodite be to satisfy all of those urges and, and desires of love? Come on. Hard, rough, sleeping in the end, want, desire, need. Aphrodite? Well, for love to have these qualities in the pursuit of Aphrodite, then what must Aphrodite have in order to satisfy those qualities of love? The opposite. Must have, must be able to bring about some resolution of those on the highest level. Or the story doesn't fit. So now we can ask the question, why does it follow if he has these qualities? Now we go to the other side Plenty. Go ahead. But from his father, again, he has designs upon beautiful and Hold good it. things. Then he must have designs on what's beautiful? Aphrodite. Aphrodite. He has designs on Aphrodite, divine beauty. He wants it. Go ahead. Being brave. He's brave. He's willing to go through whatever it takes to grasp that, share it, possess it. Go ahead. And go ahead, which... Drive. Drive. Go ahead. High-strung. High-strung. A mighty hunter. Right, because he's, hunt he's, he's on a quest. Always weaving devices. Always weaving devices, figuring out how to do it. And a successful coveter of wisdom. Right. A philosopher all his days. A successful coveter of wisdom means his father has already achieved wisdom. Therefore, he wants to, within himself, have realized what his, his, is his inheritance, his destiny. That's destiny. Adrastia, right? That's the destiny. It's got it, he has it in the background. That's his inheritance. Yes, a little more, go ahead. A philosopher all his days, a great wizard and Philosopher sorcerer. means a lover of wisdom. wisdom. If he's a lover of wisdom and he's pursuing Aphrodite, the goddess of divine beauty, then there must be a connection between divine beauty and wisdom. There must be a connection between the two. Now this is why in our culture we cannot make sense of the wisdom traditions of the world. Because we don't stress the fact that in the ancients, especially in this whole Greek Platonic world, that wisdom is the most beautiful. That's it. The highest experience of beauty is had in the experience of wisdom, or put it the other way around. The very nature of the experience of wisdom is an experience in divine beauty. They have to go together. Because love came into existence at the same time as beauty. Would you not agree if a divine beauty comes into existence, anyone who has a desire for beauty at that moment would come alive and pursue it. Anytime any of us can recognize something as both beautiful and good, what do we do? We want to go towards it. Right? St excuse me, step aside. <laughs> I don't want to be second. Necessarily then. All right, could you continue and watch it to fold? He was born neither mortal nor immortal, but on the same day, right. sometimes he's blooming and alive when he has plenty. Right, when he has plenty. And among the qualities of plenty is the successful coveter of love. I'm uh, pardon me, the successful coveter of, of uh, wisdom. wisdom. Mm -hmm. And other times? Sometimes he's dying. That's right, in want. For the, hey, you know the only problem? The only problem in the whole nature of reality, the only problem which would make it very simple for all of us, is just one thing. 
If at the moment when anyone became wise, they would vanish, get on a spacecraft, as it were. <laughs> at the very moment, if at the very moment they grasped the nature of divine beauty and therefore got into a mystical state of pure beauty, if that would end it, bang, it's over. Transformation. Transformation and gone. But the next day, the saint has to have a cup of coffee. Right? Well, the same day, right, that's right. It has a beginning, middle, and end. And therefore, <laughs> now, it's, they certainly may penetrate it more deeply. They may become great, more greatly involved in it. They may share into a greater degree. They may participate in it more fundamentally and on a more intrinsic level. All of that can be true, but <sighs> got to come out of it up and down. Yes. Go ahead. Sometimes he is dying. Mm. Again. <laughs> right. Then quickly after it. He gets new life through his father's nature. But what he procures in plenty always trickles away. So that love is not in want nor in wealth. And again, he is between wisdom and ignorance. Let's see, now we're going back here, aren't we? Mm. So now he's between ignorance and wisdom, and therefore we need a definition of both. All right, watch what he does then. The truth is this. No God seeks after wisdom or desires to become wise, for wise he is already. Nor does anyone else seek after wisdom if he is wise already. No, at the moment you're wise. In the state you don't seek it, you're in it. Enjoy it, have a cup of coffee. Right, enjoy it. And again, the ignorant do not seek after wisdom nor desire to become wise, for this is the worst of ignorance, that one who is neither beautiful and good nor intelligence should think himself good enough. So he does not desire it, because he does not think he is lacking in what he does not think he needs. Mm. Now, remember what we said earlier. All right, let's go back. Myth. Must serve a purpose. A mystery. Now, this has to come together. This we're calling the model. This we call the myth. And they now have to come together to serve a purpose. If we don't have the purpose, then we don't understand the, why the author or whoever is relating the story is using it. Therefore, that's what we need. We need the context within which to understand this. Thank goodness there's another paragraph and a short one at that. All right, remember the last point? Description of ignorance and wisdom. And therefore, Socrates comes back to Diotima and raises the most interesting question. Go right ahead. Then who are the philosophers, Diotima? If those who seek after wisdom are neither the wise nor the ignorant. No. Where are the philosophers? That's clear enough even to a child. Now, we sure. want to read this carefully enough so that we can see to what degree Diotima is using the key elements of this myth, the key elements of the model, goes back to those four distinctions, ignorance, opinion, understanding, knowledge, and wisdom, and brings them together into a unity. We want to see that, and we want to see at that moment whether it then discloses the purpose of the myth. The use of the model brought together, if we can see that, then we'll understand the myth. And as I say, we're very lucky, it's a short paragraph. Could you be so kind as then to go into that? All right, now let's do it together now, all right? This is the myth. Uh, okay, I'll underline it. Be nice to have another blackboard. Yeah, go ahead. They are those between these two. Ah, uh, the model? As love is. As love is, the model? Right, that's where love is between these two? And that's where philosophy is between. Yeah, read it again, please. They, the philosophers, they are those between these two as love is. Therefore, what's between these two? 
The lost piece between wisdom and ignorance. That's right. Between these two? Who, who did we say before was between these two? Love. Personified it? And his teacher. And the Yeah. Therefore, what can we put over here? Philosophers. Philosophers and deities. Right, oh. Hmm. Go ahead. You see, wisdom is one of the most beautiful ah, things. See? Wisdom has to be. One of the most beautiful things. And therefore, if you catch a glimpse of it, to the degree that you can catch a glimpse of it, it would awaken a desire for it at the same time, at the same day that you perceived it or caught a glimpse of it, or discovered its possibility, any of those. What would awaken? Love. love. There's a love for the beautiful. At the same day. Mm. Therefore, to the degree that you can, you can catch that this curious of all notions, that wisdom must be most beautiful, the most beautiful thing in the universe. All right, you got that? Wow. Then, if he can catch a glimpse of that, Right. What will he do? Pursue it. It will awaken a need, a want, a desire, will it not? So go ahead. They are those between these two as love is. You see, wisdom is one of the most beautiful things, and love is a love for the beautiful. That's it. Love is it? Love is a love. Love is a love of the beautiful. So Anytime love, anybody perceives what they regard as beautiful, it doesn't make any difference who or what they are, there's a desire naturally for it. So love must necessarily be a philosopher. And being a philosopher, he must be between wise and ignorant. His birth is the cause of this. Ah, myth. For he comes of a wise and resourceful father. Myth. Right? Go ahead. But of a mother resourceless and not wise. Right? Back in the myth. Holds them together. Well then, dear Socrates, this is the nature of the spirit. But it was no wonder spirit. you thought love what you did think. You thought, if I may infer it from what you say, that love was the beloved, not the lover. Socrates, you made a mistake. You got them confused. You thought the lover was the, was the beloved. That's your problem. Mm -hmm. See, through this entire speech of Diotima, she's going to straighten out four terms. Love, loving, the beloved, lover. The whole speech does that. The myth just picks up these aspects. Okay, go ahead. That's why I think love seemed to you wholly beautiful. For now we're going to get a new definition of it. Go ahead. For the thing love is... What's that? This, that's this. Hold it. That's this, isn't it? Mm -hmm. This is the thing love. Now, hey, look here. What are we going to do with these terms? We can then say these terms represent... Aphrodite. Try it. For the thing love is in fact beautiful and dainty and perfect and blessed, but the loving thing has a different shape, such as I've described. So, what, it, what must she be then? Divine. More? Come on, what are the qualities? What's the qualities of wisdom? You just read them. Wise, resourceful. Wise, resourceful. Brave. Hmm. Go ahead, high school. Wow. Mighty hunter, weaving devices. For the thing loved is in fact beautiful. All right. Dainty, perfect, blessed. Dainty, perfect, It's perfect. It's blessed. The word dainty isn't there. Mm. The word is tender. Tender in the sense that accessible. It can be entered into, right, tender? doesn't create obstacles. Therefore, Aphrodite must be regarded as all beautiful, perfect, blessed. Therefore, anyone then who encounters it deserves the title of the blessed. They recognize now a perception into the nature of divine beauty as perfect. Where? Where's all of this disclosed? 
and the garden of Zeus. What does that mean? Therefore, it's through the functioning of the intellect that this therefore is perceived. This is where the drama takes place. And the rest of the symposium therefore is to try to show how the individual philosopher must develop the intellect in order to get into this game so that they can perceive the nature of beauty as wisdom or wisdom as beauty, which is another expression of Aphrodite. Which would be to experience it then, Conf than to gain an understanding of it, which we have so far. Would, you're, would you not agree, what does this do? This tells us about it, does it not? And if you begin to see the reasons why what is being said is being said, if you understand the reasons why the opinions you are gaining or learning are true or right, that's understanding. But now you have to have a way to confirm it so that it's yours and not the author's alone. Right? You want to enter into it. You don't want to be told. Right? Even though it's nice to be told beautiful things, you want to get into it, do it, experience it, become part of it. So then, look here. Did Diotima then bring together the model and the myth? Did it then open up and allow us to understand the myth in a new way? Did it relate, therefore, to a higher purpose? Because one of the great mysteries is, what is this crazy thing called philosophy and the philosopher? So therefore, this myth serves a great purpose, not only to acquaint us with the metaphysical realm, of the nature of reality being wisdom itself and perfect and blessed and beautiful, but how the divine, how the intellect can therefore gain a perception of it and confirm one's understanding in a higher experience. Right? Ah, that's the very thing we were talking about. Therefore, the context of the myth presupposes the model. They both must be brought together to serve the purpose, a higher purpose, because the context allows us to see the purpose of the myth. Isn't that what we said? The purpose of the myth, there's a mystery to unfold. The mystery to unfold is the curious thing called the philosopher. And therefore, the purpose of the myth is to disclose the nature of the philosopher and philosophy within a metaphysical structure. Now we can turn around and say, hey, how does love function in the everyday world? We can say, oh, everywhere in nature and every place we can see a desire for the beautiful and procreation on the various levels in which it can be done and the way in which it's done by different kinds of entities and living entities. Can we not? We can talk about it. We can fit the everyday phenomenal within the metaphysical now. We don't go the other way around. We go to the metaphysical first work out all these relationships, and then see if we can see the everyday world on a higher level. So to be able to see the everyday world within the metaphysical context is the way of using this curious thing called philosophical myths of Plato. And that's what we've been doing. And therefore, I'm open to your questions. I think I've completed it. Have we not? Good. Does he ever describe the birth of beauty? No. Okay, my next question arises, in the Greek world, then, since he doesn't describe birth of beauty... Not here. Not in this myth. Oh, but my question is, did Plato ever describe it any, in any other myth? Or would we have to go to the standard myth of birth of Aphrodite? Well, see, um, what's interesting, if we look at myths as understood by a modern... Robert Graves. He will show that for each of these myths, they vary in different places and at different times. It's not just one. Right, exactly. So therefore, what you want to see is the highest expression and use of this, and therefore you go to those thinkers with whom that, that functions. Uh, yes, he does. Uh, uh, we can go, see, Aphrodite as divine beauty is a mythical way of expressing what is called the idea of the good. Now, the idea of the good is not a thought. It's a Greek word idea, which means to be able to behold it. So to be able to hold the good or the one, to be able to behold it, the experience that one has is Aphroditic divine beauty. 
See? That's what it is. And therefore he talks about that in various dialogues. That's the whole purpose of uh, making the metaphysical and the mythical into one continuous parallel story. Um, and uh, that's the Phaedrus. It's also the Republic, uh, centrally. And maybe we should do that next time.